How schools prepare children for life beyond school. My name is Fiona McKenzie and I'm Head of Education at Carfax Education. And I'm delighted to welcome here today to join me on the panel, Michael Strawn, who's the Head of Secondary at Arcadia School. We have Steve Giles, who is the Principal at Raffles International School. And Sean Dennis, who is Head of Prep School, GEMS Metropole School. So a really great array of talent here um, and a range of experience who are going to hopefully give us some really good guidance on this. So, I think just to kind of define the terms, what do we mean preparing children for beyond school? I think we all are very familiar with the concept that these children that are kind of entering into secondary school at this stage are entering into a fairly unknown world with the kind of advent of technology and AI. Research is telling us that at least 50% of the jobs that we have now will have disappeared by 2050. Uh, but replaced with others that we can't as yet imagine. So I really would love to understand a little bit more about how, as schools, you are preparing your pupils to enter into this unknown and unfamiliar landscape. Um, it's a very big question, so I think we might want to break it down into a little bit into like study skills, a little bit maybe into the kind of more social soft skills. And a key concept for me, having got grown up children, is this adulting thing because I think that's uh, another whole transition phase. So, Sean, can we just start with you? You know, um, at Metropole, what are the sorts of things you're putting in place beyond the kind of, you know, with the academics? First of all, let's focus on the academics and where that might take them. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so, actually, recently, this academic year, we've introduced um, a study skills session. So, we've got a bespoke session that we do with our uh, year uh, 11, 12s and 13s. Uh, which is dedicated to students being prepared for the next journey in their life. So um, that particular session is uh, we do things such as my future self. So getting students to be sort of familiar with their aspirations and actually how do they go about uh, sort of making those next steps in their journey. But also things like study skills, um, obviously making sure that they've got the, uh, the ability to be able to study effectively to be successful in their, in, in their studies. Uh, in addition to that, stuff like uh, pro-social skills that we talk about, um, so for example, how to conduct yourself in interviews uh, and things of that nature. So that's something that we do, which is a, a sort of a bespoke session that we've introduced this year on the curriculum. So I think um, we'll come back to those sort of soft skills in a moment, because yeah. I think that's, that's another whole kind of subsection of, of this, sure. the kind of employability skills. But in terms of preparing children for sort of university applications and things, what, how early do you think you should start, Steve, with that? Yeah, that, that's a really good, uh, really good question. I think um, the, the key is, as, as we probably all realize, that when you're applying to university, your first draft is not your final draft. And it's about redrafting and taking the advice and listening to different people, professionals, but also outside of the school as well, from people who, are, who have been through the process. Um, we, we, we say at Raffles International School about making your application unique and not run of the mill. Um, what is it that's dif different about you that's going to stand out to a university? Because we all study either the A-levels or IB or, or whatever curriculum. So that's a given that you're going to get your results. But it's what, what can you do that's different in, in your application that somebody will ignite in a conversation or an interview where you may be an orienteering coach or you may be you know, a sailor. And it's, it's what, what, what makes you stand out. So it's redraft and then get advice and but, feedback. But this starts so much earlier, doesn't it, than just the kind of sixth form, because actually, you know, building your profile, which I think is sort Absolutely. of what you're talking about, starts when. I mean, we've got lots of evidence of research from UCAS shows that actually children age 11 are already starting to consider their university choices, Absolutely. particularly from here in such a global environment. So, Michael, Arcadia, when do you start introducing this kind of concept of what happens after school? That school's in essentially a part of your whole journey. It's not the end in itself. Well, our motto is very much uh, lifelong learning, and so it, it, it's begins for us in year seven and we are working with the students on the Unifor platform very early. So what we find is if you wait until year 10, year 11, year 12 for students to start thinking about university, sometimes that might be too late. They might have made different choices for their options uh, and that's kind of sent them down on one particular path. So we begin very, very early on with the students working on Unifrog, showing them in a, an age appropriate way. Um, the possible pathways will take longer uh, in the future. Because again, the longer they've got to prepare, the better. But not just for the students, for the parents as well. Many of our parents are not necessarily au fait with the UK or American application system. They may have come from a different system themselves. So the earlier we can begin that process, uh, the more surprises we can avoid longer in the future. So I think that you know, if we get in early and in an age-appropriate way, we can prepare them for that flight path moving forwards. And there are no surprises later on. They're prepared for that. Um, 
onward journey. I think it's not just about university. I think sometimes uh, parents and educationists can get this wrong. We think, well, it's about getting them from year 13 into university. Well, that's one step. But then what about after university? And what about for the rest of their lives? So what I really like what Sean mentioned is those, those lifelong learning skills of the, the, how to study. When I was at school many years ago, no one taught me how to study. So I got to university and was told to write an essay. Well, I had no idea. And we don't want our students to be in that position. Um, so those sorts of things, we're doing at Arcadia as well work with students really early on those study skills. So you think schools are much more savvy now about kind of starting that process much earlier? Absolutely. And you were talking about that self-reflection piece, and I think that's really important, isn't it? Encouraging the children to reflect from an early age what their strengths are, how they can build those, and where that might take them. Yeah, it's a really good point. I, I, I think just to kind of touch on that as well, is, as UniFrog is a platform that we, we use as well, um, we, we actually start it in year nine, so we've got a careers counsellor that um, what we've kind of given her is a, is a mandate that you must have one meeting with every student in year nine. Um, and that really helps them to make sort of good informed decisions about their options because we know that obviously that's going to have a huge implication further down the line. But also not sort of understanding that it's not kind of, uh, it's not the be all and end all. You know, we, we try to get our students to have a, a sort of a broad approach at year nine, not to sort of specialize as such. And as they sort of get into sort of choosing their A levels into their sixth form, then really start to hone in. But sort of early on, just really try to sort of encourage students if, if they've got a passion, if they enjoy something and they're good at it, these are the sort of three things that we try to steer the students towards, particularly choosing their options in year nine. Uh, and obviously as they get sort of further up the chain, then sort of try to specialize it a bit more, but particularly doing those three things. I think that's an issue, isn't it, the specialization, because they do need to have a bit of an understanding about where their end goal is in order to make the right choices. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Sean's saying. Um, it's, it's what they love, it's what the students love. And I know, in, especially in Dubai, there'll be some parents who try and uh, put, not push, but suggest a certain pathway for their students to go down a certain route. But I think it's our job as educators to, to give a bit of balance and measure to that and say, well, yes, you know, you may be a doctor and your wife may be a doctor, but your student is a phenomenal artist. And actually, this is an alternative route. And it, and it, and it would be, uh, you know, for us to kind of open their eyes a little bit to the different educational journeys to a destination that could be equally, if not more rewarding eventually. Well, and I think the destinations are so different from perhaps the ones that the parents' generation had to make. And I think as educators, you have a much broader perspective. Yeah. So it is a very unique role. I, I, I kind of agree. So we've talked about this kind of the first step, maybe university or, or, or may not be, but I think for a lot of parents, that would be the kind of ambition. But again, that's still just another stepping stone, really, isn't it, in the journey to employability. And we know that now, you know, if the survey of CEOs said that the most sought after skills that they're looking for are critical thinking, communication skills, creativity, problem solving, perseverance, collaboration, information literacy, and technological skills. Now that's quite an array. And funnily enough, those aren't kind of subjects that are specifically taught in a kind of timetable. So Michael, how do you go about equipping your pupils with these sorts of skills through what is already quite a kind of disciplined and tight timetable? That's a very, very big question. Um, it is. And I'll try and be succinct on this. I think a lot of the curriculums now, you know, the IGCSE curriculum, A-level curriculum, have these sorts of skills built in. They didn't always. And if we went back 10, 15 years, they were very heavily knowledge-based. I think the, the movement towards a skills-based curriculum is something we can do. And I think also really looking at the, the extra curriculum. And I think this is one of the massive advantages of independent schools in the UK and international schools. We have a huge extra curricular um, opportunity to deliver to students. And that means then we can look at some of these skills outside of the classroom. Um, and I think that's a huge advantage that we have over schools in, in the UK, the state sector, et cetera. So I think giving those students to use those skills in a variety of activities, but also cross-curricular, rather than focusing purely on one subject, looking for opportunities for projects to go across different uh, subjects as well, is another way in which we can kind of inculcate those skills. But it's giving students the opportunities. I think it's creating those opportunities for them to move into those areas and develop those skills. This is a key thing we're trying to do at Arcadia. I mean, it is a big question. Steve, what would you kind of add to that? And, you know, how do you develop collaboration, communication, creativity? I, th I think you can do it in the classroom, first and foremost. And in any lesson, you know, you can ask the question, well, why do you think that? Bounce it to Sean. What does Sean think? Does he agree? You know, you can create that critical thinking, those arguments. And I've seen teachers, some of the very best teachers, set up a question which is wrong. On the, on the board and, and the, the children will be there and they'll be like, well, you're wrong. And the teacher will be, no, 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 I'm right. I'm the teacher. But they're set up this environment so that, the, that there's a challenge and the students are, no, no, you're wrong. And then the lesson is around proving a point and having that 
that confidence to actually challenge someone and, and, and break the norm. And that's some of the best lessons that I've seen. And actually, of course, they're still learning during that lesson, um, but at the same time arguing or discussing uh, and coming up with a solution. Um, so I think you can do it subtly in lessons, but also we have a debating club and things like that um, across the group in Interventures. So we provide CCAs, the same, the same as these guys. Um, so I think there's more than just one way of doing it, but it needs to be in life on a, on a daily basis, really, seven times a day in seven lessons. Yes, absolutely, and embedded in that cream. But I think ECAs are another kind of interesting way of delivering some of that, isn't it? Particularly that kind of team working and some other sort of more extrinsic skills. Sean, can you just sort of talk a little bit about how that works in your school? ECAs. The ECAs, and how what yeah. the skill sets you feel that the children acquire from those? Yeah, for sure. Um, so in terms of our ECA provision, um, we, there are a number of things that we offer that, that do help in that regard. I'm, I'm thinking of the Duke of Edinburgh that we do. Um, so, so, I mean, that cultivates real sort of vital life skills that, that, that are timeless, I would argue, um, and that, that definitely suit that. Uh, in addition to that, there are a number of things. So we have leadership roles which extend beyond the classroom. So we've got eco-leaders, um, we've got global uh, citizenship leaders. Um, uh, I, mean, I think we've got four or five different sort of separate cohorts of leadership groups in addition to our prefects and our school counsellors and so on, that all have their own indiv individual focus and through their efforts, I mean they meet at break time, lunch time, after school uh, and they have a huge amount of work in regards to sort of student advocacy and, and sort of uh, really banging the drum for different areas and they cultivate these skills. Uh, only sort of the weekend just gone we hosted an MUN conference and the students that were involved in that were, were deeply rooted in, in sort of developing their analytical skills and, and sort of uh, and questioning and, and so on and so forth. And, and these, these sort of activities are really crucial. 100%. I think it is, and I think parents really need to understand that, don't they? That you know, education is much broader. Everybody's got the same results yeah. these days, yeah. more or less. They're doing a similar thing. It is, as you, as you started out, Steve, it's what makes you kind of stand out and building these skills and this kind of resilience. Um, and that slightly brings me on to kind of the, the life skills. I mean, I have a number of students who, when I'm sending them off to university, I say, now, can you please make sure you learn to cook three meals before you go? You learn how to use the washing machine, um, and you know, you know a little bit about how to look after yourself. Because I think that is sometimes a little bit of a gap in, in new here and it falls between maybe parents and schools to kind of yeah. do this where, where where do you sit with that Steve um, well first of all I was just saying to these gentlemen that my son left home this summer um, and the added thing to living in Dubai is you know nine times out of ten it's not just going to university but you're you're leaving the country as well and you're off to sort of fend for yourself so I saw it as a dad as a parent um, trying to help my son learn how to cook and wash and clean and uh, actually change a duvet. He, you know, he didn't have a clue. He's just literally FaceTime me. He's got a duvet and a cover. And he, so I was trying to explain to him how to do that. Um, but I think as role models in school, we have mentors to the students as well. And we have an open door policy so that if the students feel that they perhaps can't speak to their parents about something we're a little bit shy or nervous about asking, then they can come to one of their mentors and they can speak to them and, and maybe ask those questions. We also have a careers guidance counsellor who's in school full time. Um, and, and as Sean said, it doesn't, it's not just the sixth form, it goes right down to the younger ones, but obviously those who are leaving imminently have more pertinent questions around that than the younger ones. But um, I, think, I think the thing is they need to realise that they're not on their own. You know, that they've got support and I tell them or I suggest to them to check in with people all the time and ask questions and there's no, you, you shouldn't be afraid of asking questions. So we have a policy in school, not a policy, but an ethos where it's okay to ask and they do. So we feel that we support them um, before they go to university. Um, we actually say to them to take it, to, to we give them a fridge magnet and we say put the fridge magnet on the fridge and then take a photo and send it to us then open the fridge and show us that you got some food <laughs> But I think it is just some of those basic skills. And I know, you know, I, I have students coming back to me all the time saying, I had no idea it was going to be like this, Fiona. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel that we all need to do a much better job about helping them through this transition from school into university. Yeah. Michael, what other things do you think we could all be doing as a sort of parent and school collaboratively to help these students? So I think it's very much the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If children can't look after themselves and feed themselves, how are they going to be successful at university lectures, uh, seminars, etc.? So Arcadia, from, from primary, we're actually teaching children life skills. So they learn in our Aspire program how to cook. So 
they actually have a cookery lesson once a, you know, once a term for the year. Um, we just look at financial literacy. That's a huge thing um, for some students yeah. going off. I don't know about you guys, but when yeah. I went off and got a student loan for the first time, I felt very, very rich for about three days, not for the rest of the term. So making sure students know how to manage their finances, and that's something we do from an early age, from year seven all the way through. So making sure students are equipped, but I'll just come back to what Steve mentioned there, that, that emotional strength, because it's going to be tough. They're going to be away from their family. So making sure that we have our pastoral program in place and, and our um, PSHE program to help support those students in their emotional development. So when they go away and they have a bad day, it's okay. They know how to get that. They've got a, a toolkit of things they can use to get through those, those difficult kind of times. So definitely making sure they have the, the, the emotional, mental, and physical capacity to support themselves when they're away from the sport network. And just picking up something that Steve mentioned, um, a lot of students are very much cosseted here in Dubai. They have a much easier life in Dubai, housemaids driven around, etc., than many of their peers will have in the UK. So I think that gap in skills is something we need as a school uh, and as parents need to look to try and close as much as possible. Sometimes for parents, it's removing some of the scaffolding and making things a little bit more difficult yeah. um, and, and maybe getting them to do their own a bit of cooking at home and a bit of ironing at home. And so they're prepared on, a, on an age-appropriate scale, um, but preparing them for that, that eventual flight from the nest, I think it's something parents can do. I think schools here are doing a lot more as we progress, uh, but I think parents definitely can support that process, having those conversations and making sure the children aren't hit by that kind of brick rule when they yeah. move away, and all those scaffoldings removed in one fell swoop. It's taking away a bit at a time, we think it's Yeah, and in a sense, that's kind of educating parents again, I think, isn't it, which has been a bit of a theme uh, t today. But I think one of the other kind of misconceptions is, because obviously all these children are being educated in English medium schools, and perhaps they're going to go to university in, in the UK, or maybe the US, English medium it's all going to be very similar. But actually, the cultural differences can be really quite a shock, can't they? Sean, have you got anything to, add, to say about that? Yeah, just only one thing that comes to mind um, is we've timetabled for this academic year for our alumni students to come in. Um, so for each term, we've got one alumni student that's been invited in, uh, calendarized, and they come and actually, it's, there's no adults in the room, and they actually go into the, uh, our sixth form uh, prefect room uh, sort of suite uh, and they give a sort of a candid, kind of honest, this is what university life is like. Uh, and I think they found last year, I know in particular, they found it very useful. Um, so we've got our first one upcoming as well. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's been really crucial for them to, to be able to get the sort of the raw, kind of real, this is exactly the sort of the, you know, how it is in real life. I think that's such a great idea because actually there's nothing like getting it from, from the horse's mouth. We actually run sessions when the children have got their offers and they've confirmed their places. We do actually webinars with, for parents, this is what you need to know, this is how you can help your kid get settled, and also for the students with current students sharing their tips and advice. Because it can be such a daunting stage, you're coming from somewhere so familiar into a completely new environment. But I think I love what you were saying about encouraging them to ask questions and to speak because I think if you are struggling, that's such an important um, confidence to to have the confidence to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that, that the guys have just said, um, there are a lot of opportunities when you move ab abroad or you go to university, but it's, it's good and bad opportunities. You know, you need to educate them that joining a, a, a club or a, a team is a really good opportunity, but maybe the, um, the opportunities to, to do things which perhaps aren't what would be the, the norm, like in Dubai, illegal or not the norm, and then suddenly they're out and they're in a big city where there's a lot of um, things that they could be swayed by. And I think it's that, it's, it's giving them measure and balance so that they make the, take opportunities but make sure they don't go down the wrong path. And I think that's key. And I think Sean's just knocked the nail on the head then about, I think that's a really good idea for bringing ex-students back um, to, to talk without any adults is brave, but I think, um, I think it's a really good thing. And, and I think those students certainly would, should be able to ask any questions in those sessions and not be judged. And I think that's key. Yeah, because it is yeah, it's very rare to have that opportunity, I yeah. think, unless you've kind of got family who are, who are already there. So just kind of finally, I want to touch on this kind of concept of adulting, because um, my children are all grown up now, all adults. Um, but my goodness me, this adulting thing is, is a journey. Um, so what kind of skills, again, I think we've touched on financial literacy, which I think is really, really important, and that kind of budgeting, because that hasn't traditionally been something that's bought. But I guess by adulting, I mean things like taking out loans, you know, um, buying a house, forming relationships, that sort of thing. Do you think we could do more in schools to help them kind of gain these adulting skills? I think it's a really, really good question, another massive question. I think there needs to be a balance between experiential learning 
and learning that takes place in the school. And I think a lot of the adulting, for me anyway, was in that the big bad world. I think you learn it through experience. Um, listening to the, the chaps on the stage with me today, I'm reassured about what we are doing as schools. So we're offering plenty. Definitely none of this was offered when I was at school, and, and you know, even going back 10 or 15 years, this is not something that schools delivered. So I think we are doing quite a lot. Can we do more? Obviously. Um, but I think part of it is taking the mystique away from adulting. These are just normal things that everyone's expected to do. It's nothing scary. It's nothing over and above you know, what any regular person would do. Um, and I think we're doing a good job so far. Without blowing our own trumpets as educators, I think we're doing a lot for the, for the children moving forwards. But some of it is just about them growing into being an adult and, it, and getting things wrong and learning through mistakes is absolutely fine. I think there's a danger if we provide too much, but we're going to miss out on those discovery experiences and, and you know, some bad experiences maybe, but they'll learn from those. So I think there needs to be a balance. We can't do everything for them and we can't explain. There'll be no surprise. Spoiler alert. I don't what's gone. We're doing everything for them. So some of it should be, you know, should, should be a surprise, I think. But I think it's also preparing them how to handle that, isn't it? It's, it's you know, when things don't go wrong and, pe and you know, people fail at something, it's, it's the school culture where you say, that's OK, it's all just part of learning. And that will, I think, help set them up for dealing with some of the challenges maybe later on. Now, a lot of parents ask me, you know, Fiona, I really need to kind of make sure I'm future-proofing my child's education. So if I was just to go around the panel and say, what would be your kind of key piece of advice about helping parents, children to future-proof themselves, what would that be? Sean, can I start with you? Sorry, bowling that no one pressure. at you. Um, no pressure at all. I'm just thinking in terms of what, what I did a couple, of week, a couple of years ago was I looked on the World Economic Forum. Um, I think if you look at stuff like that, stuff like um, UNESCO, um, there's, a, there's a couple of sort of platforms that are really good at kind of forecasting where the market is going in terms of different industries. Um, I think sort of in the spirit of sort of starting with the end in mind, I think that's always a good, good thing to do is to try and, you know, forecast what's to come. But I mean, quite frankly, we never know. Um, but I think, I think sort of trying to look at um, particularly some of those uh, platforms that have a, a good sort of research-based approach to, to sort of forecasting how sort of different markets and industries are going to, to look going forward, that's a really good way to start. Okay, so sort of, yeah, beginning to imagine what that future could look like and then what you need to put in place. Michael, what about you? What do you think that's kids a, can do? That's a fantastic to answer. Um, well done. Um, I'd, I'd probably suggest looking at what are the timeless skills, what are the timeless things, communication, teamwork. If, if your child can be a really well-rounded, decent human being that gets on with people, can hold a conversation, yeah. it's, it's good manners, I know it's not really fashionable, but courteous, good manners, someone that you would want to work with in a company, I think, you know, whatever the job is, they'll be okay. So I think it's those, those a good emotional intelligence um, and a good, a good well-rounded person that you enjoy having a conversation with is, is probably the best thing because I don't know about you, but I really can't predict the future. It's getting harder and harder and harder 10 years from now, five years from now. With AI, will they even be working five years from now? We really don't know. So I think those timeless skills, if you went back 150 years, being able to communicate, a good team worker, good interpersonal skills, you'd be okay then. So I think hopefully in 50, 100 years, those will be timeless skills to suggest for students. Time, time would suggest that is exactly the case. I completely agree. I completely agree with these guys. Um, I was just self-reflecting, actually, when, when they were talking. I was thinking three years ago, I didn't know what Teams was. And then COVID came along, and I remember getting a call, and them saying, we're going to go to Teams. And I was like, great, I love Teams. They were like, no, Teams. And I was like, I had no idea what it was. And then more recently, um, November last year, everyone started talking about ChatGPT. And I'm like, what's ChatGPT? I had no idea what it was. And I think at my age, um, if I can kind of learn these new skills and, and, and try and take these opportunities. I think my advice to, to young people as they go off to university would be keep up to date with technology and don't be afraid of it. Exactly what these guys were saying about, you know, making friends, being a nice person, um, but also at the same time, keep your, your finger on the pulse. And if something comes along, go for it and so don't be afraid. Seize, seize opportunities. So I think essentially what we're saying is that schools here, if you can prepare your children to be nice kids who are kind of going to be good additions to the kind of the world, prepare them to love learning because they're going to need to keep learning, aren't they, through this, this ever-changing world that we're, that we're kind of living in and be flexible and be able to pivot. I think probably it sounds like you guys are doing all of that and more besides. So thank you all very much indeed for joining us today and for sharing your kind of wisdom and your thoughts on that. So thank you very much to Michael and to Steve and to Sean. Um, you can find them on their stands here. And so please do go and ask them further questions about that. And if you'd like to know more about what we do at Carfax Education, we're at the back. So do come and see us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.